Articles 5 be read a second time. Sir Peter Bottomley. I hope the Honourable Member will forgive me if I don't follow her line in debate. We've got less than 50 minutes left to deal with something that's both complicated, important and a matter of justice. I pay tribute to my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, for saying in the Commonwealth that the Commonwealth is about fairness and justice. And I'm going to argue for a significant review into what we do with overseas pensioners. If uh, the House will forgive me for reading out a paragraph from Lord Hoffman in the Carson case, uh, the role of Regulation 5 of the 1975 regulations, statutory instrument 1975 stroke 563 is amended. In paragraph 8 he says, the general rule, subject to limited exceptions, has always been that social security benefits are payable only to inhabitants of the United Kingdom. A person, quote, absent from Great Britain, end of quote, is disqualified, colon, Section 113, bracket 1 of the Social Security Contributions to Benefits Act 1992. But there is a power to make exceptions by regulation. Regulation 4 of the Social Security Benefit, brackets Persons Abroad, end of bracket, Regulation 975, Statutory Instrument 975-563, bracket, deemed to have been made under the 1992 Act, end of bracket, makes such an exception for retirement pensions. But Regulation 5 makes an exception to the exception. In the absence of reciprocal treaty arrangements, persons ordinarily resident abroad continue to be disqualified from receiving the annual increases. The House might expect that the pensioners abroad who don't get the increases are the exception. Were the House to think that, they would be wrong. 650,000 overseas pensioners get the increase, and they include countries like the United States and Jamaica. 500 and a number, maybe 530,000, maybe 570,000, don't get the increases. And they are predominantly in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Pakistan, uh, and then uh, Yemen and Japan, two of the others in the, in the top ten. No one can claim there's rhyme or reason in that. Before I was elected to this House, the then Julian Ridsdale in 1972 in December, had a debate answered by Paul Dean. Paul Dean, the minister, said that these matters were governed by reciprocal treaties and the government was keen on having reciprocal treaties. I think if the Prime Minister were to invite various government departments to contribute to a whole of government review, which is what I would ask for, he'd find that the Foreign Office now openly say they don't want reciprocal agreements in part because some of the old dominions, the Commonwealth countries, provide increases to their pensions in Britain without us agreeing to do the same thing there. That doesn't strike me as a good argument for not having a reciprocal agreement. It strikes me as a good argument for having one. The Prime Minister, were he to ask for this review, would probably hear from the Department for Work and Pensions, is this the year where it's a priority to give increases to those who aren't resident in this country? The reason this is relevant to today's debate is the Minister, in his Clause 20, purports to exclude overseas pensioners from getting increases under the new scheme, except that it doesn't quite say so in words in the, in the clause in the bill, for making regulations which would allow them to do it, the exception to the exception. I will spare the House analysis of the provisions in Clause 18, which are even too complicated for me to, to be able to put across in a way that anyone else would understand. Going back to Clause 20, what the government is proposing is, to deliberate, is deliberately to continue the discrimination against some of our overseas pensioners. There's no rhyme or reason. Being a member of the Commonwealth doesn't necessarily bring you in or put you out, although predominantly it is the, what I call the old dominions who are affected. The government would say from the uh, Department of Work and Pensions, would hear from the Department of Work and Pensions, why should we do it now? Well, the argument that Julian Ridsdale was putting forward in 1972 was about a far smaller number of people. If at the moment my honourable right honourable friend the Minister would say 2% of our pensioners are abroad, that is a dramatically higher proportion than it was in 1972. And it's going to grow. People will earn their rights to pensions in this country. We have a far more mobile population, both people coming here and going out, we know with the expansion of the European Union that those countries which we, with whom we would not have necessarily claimed a very close uh, connection over the generations will come in. And without wanting to stir up some of the popular papers, 
uh, the, the new members of the European Union will not be excluded from getting increases in pensions, whether their people come here and work and, and earn an entitlement, or people who are resident or even nas nationals of our country go and live, for example, in Bulgaria or Romania. They'll get the increases. But those who may have retired to South Africa shortly after the 1947 Pensions Act don't. And the reason was, in 1947, we weren't expecting to get inflation. If we didn't have inflation, we wouldn't have the problem. If the government said they aren't going to provide exceptions to Clause 20 and that no pensioner overseas will get an increase, at least we'd have consistency. But that, I think, is not what the Minister's proposing. And it might be helpful um, if he could confirm that either now or if and when he comes to speak. I'll give way to John Redwood. Does he know if... Um the requirement to uprate uh, in European Union countries is a European requirement which the government can do nothing about, or is it a government choice? Uh, the government chose and Parliament endorsed that you would have free movement of people and I think of, of, of benefits in this sense, but our friend the Minister will no doubt be able to answer my right of a friend with greater uh, certainty than, than I would. The, the essential point is that as a country joins the European Union, or, or even joins EFTA, I think, that the entitlement to increases in pensions comes in with it. I would anticipate, or I would have anticipated when I was preparing my thoughts on this, that the Prime Minister might say that he would give consideration to the calls for a wider review of the issue, and I suspect he'll conclude that he's not minded to pursue the review at this time. Now, that's the gentlest form of no I've come across. I suspect, as and when we extend voting rights to British nationals who are overseas, either for a period of 15 years or even longer, as many other countries do, that our members of parliament representing these overseas resident voters will start putting the pressure on and change will come. I think the Prime Minister may be anticipating that. It may be that the Prime Minister actually sees the sense and justice of this, but given his position, he has to be saying no to a lot of uh, popular causes in this country. And the idea of the justice element about which he's rightly praised in the Commonwealth hasn't quite come to his mind yet. He might think of saying... In fact, I know he does think of saying, because I received a letter about half an hour ago, which confirms what I anticipated, that the case for not departing from the position of successive governments is clear. I've already pointed out where they've changed on the reciprocal arrangements. He would have pointed out to him it would cost hundreds of millions of pounds at a time when the pressure on the welfare system is considerable and where we're asking many people who live in the UK to make sacrifices. That could be an argument, I should think, to cut off the increases for all pensions overseas. That's not going to happen. not going to be proposed. The anomaly is supposed to continue. It's gone from 1972 to 2013. If I'm here in 20 years' time, will we still have ministers trotting out the same arguments that they used in 1972? I jolly well hope not. The pensioners overseas, and I pay tribute especially to the leaders in Canada and in Australia, uh, had work done by Oxford Economics for the International Consortium of British Pensioners, making the case for the healthcare savings. We all know that our major costs to the health service in our last weeks or last year of life. If people live overseas, which are the ones most likely to return to this country for their end-of-life health care? I would suggest it's likely the United States, where their insurance may have run out and their money may not meet the costs, and possibly people in Europe who may want to come to this country to be treated in the health service they know and in a language they're used to. I doubt many will come back from New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, or Canada. So I think the health care arguments matter, which is why I call for, in fact, we call for the, the whole of government review. And I pay tribute to my honourable friend, member Thanet, who came with me to join the Prime Minister last week when he very kindly gave us uh, the opportunity of putting some of these cases to him. The Department for Work and Pensions. I'll give both record. And in case I don't get the opportunity to intervene, I think it's important that we place on the record uh, my honourable friend has already referred to the <coughs> leaders of the campaign in Canada and Australia. And Jim Tilley told us from Australia of the case of the Australian, the, the, the lady, the English lady living in Australia, on six pounds a week. The rest of the money that she has to live on is paid by the Australian government because our government can't give it to her. Does that make my honourable friend feel proud? I find it shaming. One of the reasons to be active in party and political service and public service is to identify injustice and to work against it. It may take months, it may take years, it may take decades, 
but it is a fight which I would like to see more support from the benches opposite and from my own side as well. My old friend has referred to Jim Tilley. I want to refer to John Markham, who is the Director of Public Affairs for the International Consortium of Pensioners. He's based uh, in Toronto in Canada. He points out that actually 10% of all pensioners live abroad, about a million people. He says 50% get the increase, roughly 50 don't, based on the country of residence. That's arbitrary, that's historic, that's unjustifiable. I'm not, by the way, going to quote back the words to the minister that he said before he became a minister, because uh, some, some people have to go through that, that embarrassment. I don't want to uh, extend it. What I would say is that when we come to Remembrance Sunday, an Armistice Day, it's the countries where we have shared war memorials which are the ones most likely to be affected. Where former people who served in the British Empire and Commonwealth armies are the ones who are not getting the increase. John Markham goes on to say that the recent Select Committee report on the new single tier pension bill declared an anomaly that should be fixed. I've made reference to the Oxford Economics report. Apart from work and pension, you might say it's a small survey, and even they would say that benefits will take years to accrue. Well, the sooner you start, the better. But the argument for doing it is not that it's going to pay this country, but because it's right. I could go through the other arguments used by Julian Ridsdale, but given the amount of time we've got for this debate, it would be interesting to hear what the Labour front bench have got to say. I know that some other people want to speak on this issue and on others that are grouped with it. So if I may, Mr Speaker, I want to declare what I think is probably the best judgment we could make when we come to the end of this debate. We will say no to Clause 20 being admitted, but we will not force a walk-through division, because I think that's a way of illustrating what we feel, but because of the shortness of time, we won't take up the rest of the time of the House, because we have to get on to the third reading as well, which has a short period as well. I hope the House will understand that. Um, Caroline Lucas.